now that we have defined what the proof is, it's important to now talk about the fact that there are different ways of establishing a proof or there are different strategies for establishing the proof. Again, I want to remind that these are strategies. These are not a specific procedure that you follow and get the proof. There are different ways of approaching the same claim or the same statement we are trying to prove, but they use different different styles. Okay. Uh, so the, in this uh, in this uh, lecture here, we'll talk about two such techniques are called direct and, and contrapositive, and they are very simple, really. Direct proof is that suppose I want to prove a statement of the form P implies Q. The direct proof is assume P is true and show that Q is true. Okay, this is what the direct proof. So really go after it in a direct way. It's the statement is if P then Q, well, assume P is true and go after Q, try to establish it. So let's see such an example of a simple result that we can establish using direct proof. So as a reminder, a number is even, an integer is even, if you can write it as two times another integer, and it's odd if you cannot. It basically says it's odd if, you, if the number is of the form two times an integer plus one. So suppose someone gives us this claim, the result, say prove this, to be a theorem that if n is an odd integer then n squared is odd so what is p and what is q here if n is an odd integer so this is p here this is p then n squared is odd this is q okay so how do i prove this now we cannot just keep writing the proof as line by line and using this kind of clean notation and, and referring to lines now we start writing it really as a narrative as a paragraph in english in, in most in most cases, you will, this is how you will see the proofs in math books and so on. So the proof to do this, the proof is, says if n is an odd integer, keep what is this talking about here? It's basically talking about every odd integer, okay? This is not about specific odd integer. So the proof we say, you know, usually the way you would say, let, let n be an odd integer, okay? Let n be an odd integer. So here we are talking about an arbitrary odd integer. Then by definition, what does it mean? What does it mean to be an odd integer? By definition, there exists an M in, that's an integer. So Z is the set of integer. By definition, this means that there exists an M such that N equals to M. Or I could have said there exists a K such that N is, is, uh, is 2K. But since it's odd, this is 2m plus 1, right? So now I want to show that n squared is odd. So if n is 2m plus 1, then n squared is 2m plus 1 squared. And now we are almost done because let's actually try to look at this number here. This is 4m squared plus 4m plus 1. And this can be written as 2, two times 2m squared plus 2m plus 1. This is an integer here. 2m squared plus 2m is an integer. So n squared is 2 times an integer plus 1. Therefore, n squared is odd. And we are done with the proof. So this is a direct proof. I started from the premise and I basically went all the way to the conclusion here. Another way of using, another example of using direct proof. So an integer j is a perfect square if there is an integer k such that j is k squared. So 4 is a perfect square. 9 is a perfect square. 16 is a perfect square and so on. So here we are saying if m and n are both perfect squares, then m n is also a perfect square. Okay. So again, this is, this is p here m and n are perfect this is p m n is also perfect square this is q again the proof let's assume or let that m let's say m is k squared and n equal l squared so i'm starting to write it a little bit you know uh, in in shorthand writing here i'm not writing everything that assume it is it is perfect square therefore there exists a k and so on so assume m equals k squared n equals l squared for integers k and l. Then what is m times n? It is k squared times l squared. 
but we can write this as kl squared. kl is an integer. m times n is an integer squared. Therefore, mn is a perfect square. We are done. This is what we wanted to establish. Okay. So this is what the direct proof is. And it's a very, very simple thing. Now, sometimes going straight from P to Q is, is challenging. And instead of doing that, actually, we go from not Q to not P. So if I want to prove that P implies Q, instead of me saying, let me assume P and establish Q, I can say, let me assume not Q and establish not P. When we talked about logical equivalences, we said that these two statements are exactly the same. P implies Q and not Q implies not P are logically equivalent. Okay. So let's try to, to show an example of proof by contrapositive or contraposition here. Prove that if N is an integer and 3N plus 2 is odd. So this is really P here. So if 3 plus N plus 2 is odd, then N is odd. Okay, so and we are talking about integers here. If 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. If I wanted to prove this using direct proof, I would start by saying, assume 3n plus 2 is odd, let's now prove n is odd. But I want to prove it by contrapositive here. And the proof is, I want to assume not q and show not p. So I say, assume n is even because this is not p, right? So if n is even, this means that is n equals 2k for some integer k. So if n equals 2k, then what is 3n plus 2? It is 3 times 2k plus 2. This is 6k plus 2, which is 2 times 3k plus 1. But this is even. Therefore, 3n plus 2 is even. So we sh I showed that if n is even, then 3n plus 2 is even, which is equivalent to saying that I showed that if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. Okay, so this is how we establish a proof by contraposition. Similarly, here this is another uh, simple case that suppose that uh, n equals a b for some integers a and b, they are both integers, then at least one of those numbers, a and b, is smaller than or equal to the square root of n. So here, this is q, okay? This, all of this is q, and this is p here. If n equal a, b, again, a and b, the statement that a and b are positive integers is also part of p, uh, then q. So if I wanted to prove it, I can start by not q. Assume not q. What does it mean? Assume not a is smaller than or equal to square root of n, or b is smaller than or equal to square root of n. But what is this? This is the same as saying, assume a greater than or equal, sorry, not equal, greater than square root of n, and b greater than square root of n. Okay, I just applied de Morgan's law here, right? The negation of p or q, or r or s, is the is not r and not s. But if a is greater than square root of n and b is greater than square root of n, then a times b greater than square root of n times square root of n, which is n. Okay? So a, b is greater than n, but this is negation of p. So I went, assume not q, I, I showed that not p. Therefore, I have also shown that p implies q, and we are done. Some trivial uh, or, or some basic proof techniques also like one of them is the exhaustive proof that sometimes you can, if the proof or the statement is about a small number of possibilities that you can just explore all of them, no need to be fancy about it, just, you know, evaluate it for all these values. So imagine that I am trying to prove that n plus 1 squared greater than or equal to 3 to the n for every positive integer smaller than or equal to 4, okay? So if this is the case, then what are the positive integers that are smaller than or equal to 4? They are 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
This is all we have. So now I can evaluate this statement for each one of them. So when n is 1, 1 plus 1 squared is 4. It is greater than or equal to 3, right? So this is true. When, it, when n is 2, 2 plus 1 squared is 9. And greater than or equal to 3 to the second, which is 9. This is true. When n is 3, this is 3 plus 1 squared, which is 16 greater than 3 to the third, which is 27 here. Is this true now? So we have 3 plus 1 squared. It is 4 squared is 16, greater than or equal to 27. In fact, we see that this is not even a true statement, and it didn't work. So actually, if I, if I change this to n smaller than or equal to 2, then we have this being true here, okay? So I apologize about that. But, but again, this is actually through this mistake that I had on the slide. You can see that if the result is, is incorrect and you are trying to, to prove it, you should fail at some point in the proof. You should not be able to prove a result that's not correct, okay? So if I'm trying to prove that n plus 1 squared greater than or equal to 3 to the n for every positive integer smaller than or equal to 2, there are two such integers. I can just evaluate it for these two. Okay, and suppose I want to prove that the 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 only consecutive positive integers not exceeding hundred that are perfect powers are eight and nine. Again, what are the perfect powers between between uh, you know one and hundred? So eight and nine. Eight is two to the third. Nine is three squared then you can look at every possible square between between 1 and 100. You will find that these are the only two. Again, this is, there's a small, not a small here. I mean, it's between 1 and 100, but you can think about it as it's a finite and relatively small values. You don't have to, you cannot do anything fancy about this here. You have to look at them and try to evaluate all the values. Okay. And the last thing I want to say in this part here is that you can actually break sometimes a result you are trying to prove into cases. So, for example, if I want to prove n is an int, if n is an integer, then n squared greater than or equal to n. So, when you look at integers, sometimes you can look at it as three cases. For example, okay. So you can look at you don't have to, but you can look at case one, n is greater than zero. So you look at the positive numbers. Case two, n is zero, and case three, you can look at the negative numbers. So you can break your proof into the three cases, and these cases actually exhaust all the possibilities. So no, look at that I didn't miss any, any integer here. And I can establish the result for all cases. So if n is greater than, if n is greater than zero, then n squared is greater than or equal to n times n, and this is greater than or equal to n times one, right? Because this n is greater than or equal to one given the assumption that n is greater than 0, and this is n. So n squared is greater than n. If n is 0, I don't need to do much. 0 squared is greater than 0, and I'm done. When n is smaller than 0, the only thing we, can, we need to say here is that n squared is positive. Therefore, n is smaller than or equal to n0, and we are done. Okay? So you can break it like this into three cases. Sometimes you don't have to. I mean, you can just prove it in one assumption that applies to all all integers, negative, positive, or even zero, uh, and and so on. Okay. So again, here in this in this lecture, we talked about proof, direct proof, and proof by the contrapositive. And again, at the end, we talked about these exhaustive proofs or trying to look at, uh, you know enumerate all possible cases to which the theorem applies when it is a small number of them. And sometimes it helps to break the statement into cases. But keep in mind there the cases have to exhaust all the possibilities. So if you are trying to prove something about all integers, you can prove it, you know, once for the positives, once for negatives, once for zero, and so on. And, um, and it's very important that you do all of them, okay? Otherwise, you are not proving the theorem correctly.